<laughs> OK, everyone, um, we're going to get started now with the. Uh, future technology needs panel discussion, so we thought it'd be a fun way to wrap up the meeting by just having a conversation with uh, some of our experts here, our expert instructors on um, what they see as the future, and we'll also uh, work in some some uh, uh, sort of more practical questions. And if you have also uh, questions about things, you can post them on the Q and A live event. I'll get us started with some of my own questions, but uh, but I will um, <coughs> I will be looking there and trying to pull in what I can. So here's what I'm going to do. Uh, the first question I want to ask, I, I think. Uh, I realized if I if I had to answer it, which I will attempt to do also, it might take me a little while to think about it. So I'm going to say it first and then I'm going to go to the second question, which is a little bit easier. So the first question is, are there a set of experiments or measurements that are critical to make, but current technology won't allow them? And I wanted to ask each of our panelists like what what was on their mind. And so maybe but but I, I don't even know what I would answer that with. So like I, uh, so I'm going to go to question number two while you guys ponder that. So maybe this one isn't any easier, but question number two and we'll just go around. Um, uh, if there's going to be another Nobel Prize in mass spectrometry, what will it be for? So um, I was, uh, I, which one of you has a, you know, maybe you could say they're all taken up, uh, but, <laughs> but, that, <laughs> but of the existing technologies, what, what has come along since the last Nobel Prize in mass spec, which would have been electrospray and MALDI, right? Ionization methods. And before that, folks won for different types of mass analyzers like uh, Wolfgang Paul for quadrupole ion trap and quadrupole. And before that, I don't know all the history here, but we had uh, reference to Scott McClucky's lecture on Francis Aston, who won for discovery of isotopes. Maybe that was one of the first ones. But is there a is there a Nobel Prize winner lurking among us, uh, like in terms of technologies? Does anybody have any uh, thoughts on that? I just thought that'd be a fun one we could kick off. And if the audience has ideas, they can toss them up and I'll read them out. Yeah, for technologies. Who wants to go first? So I'm not 100 percent sure. Does does Nobel Prize have to be like a technology specific or can be can it be an application? It can be whatever we want it to be right now because it's all okay. hypothetical. <laughs> what are important discoveries that you think are are uh, prize worthy in our field? Yeah, how about that? <laughs> OK, I mean, I think that that maybe like the person who figures out how we can use metabolomics to like to like really not metabolomics mass spec met to 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 really get at that uh personalized i i don't want i mean personalized medicine like to figure that out like to really make it work that could yeah be i think that's a huge opportunity like, that's sort of thinking about to... game changers right yeah, that's a game changer for sure, but it hasn't been done quite yet. Not not yeah. really like to the fact where it's like integrated into like everybody's life. Yeah, like and in your toilet. Like, yeah. yeah, well. Yeah, I was, was going to think, it's yeah, that may be like a more Nobel Prize for like a medicine or something. Yeah, or maybe. Yes, yeah. yeah. Definitely. So what do you guys think? Is there any existing innovations that haven't yet been recognized at that level? That that should be. Well, a, a few years ago, if you asked me, I would say like Orbi trap, given the the predominant usage and the, the impact it has for the field, uh, all these omics really propelled by the, you know, the, the um, invention of the orbit trap and certainly center around those that you can look at both large molecules, small molecules, all of these was high resolution and the capacity and speed. Uh, obviously, yeah. recently there are also other uh, com competitive technology, but yeah, I think that one definitely has the, I would say in terms of the, the scale of impact, that could be one that I would really. Yeah, I agree. Be. And in fact, uh, uh, a couple of our students have posted perhaps something combined like FT, so Orbitrap and FTICR. That that seems plausible. I agree with that. Uh, uh, John, what do you think? Yeah, I was going to I was going to mention the Orbitrap too as an, as one that felt deserving. 
I know there's a lot of uh, iMobility stuff starting to, starting to become a much more popular thing. Um, I'm not really sure who where that where that started, um, but um, you know that could potentially be something on on the rise as well. Um, but the first thing that came to mind was the Orbi trap. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, well let's go. With, maybe while you think on the first one, so future uh, Jessica's um, out there with uh, with the idea of personalized measurements. I I totally agree. I think if one could figure out how to do that, definitely would be a big deal. Um, has any, if you guys thought of any other, like what are other experiments or measurements that um, that we would love to make? So I think uh, Jessica suggested if we could integrate them into our lives for you know personalized medicine, that would be a big deal. I completely agree. Are there other opportunities that uh, as a field or measurements that that really if we could make? So you know, I best when I was thinking about that question, I was thinking you know plasma measurements but blood plasma is so important but so hard to do at least the proteomic side is hard uh, lipid and metabolite a little more approachable but still not you know as as um uh, quick as uh, as some types of detection but if one could really do a, a multi-ohm plasma very deeply and well that could be pretty transparent sort of building off of jessica's idea yeah, something that's really interesting to me is exposure and exposure to certain lots of chemicals and chemical mixtures. And I think coming up with a high throughput at some sort of assay that allows you to screen effects of chemicals on certain omic pathways. And um, that's something that I'm interested in, especially as it pertains to exposure in the microbiome. Um, I think there's a lot of a lot of research that needs to be done. Uh, we know there's a lot of chemicals that we ingest and are ubiquitous in the body, but maybe you know very little about their effect on things like the microbiome. Uh, there's right now most of the testing is done in vivo in zebrafish or uh, you know, rodents, and you know there's there's a lot of assumptions we're making that those actually apply to what goes on in a human. Um, so, in, you know, useful in vitro methods where you can screen a lot of different chemicals and mixtures, I think would be something I'm, I'd be really interested in. Very good. Uh, in June, if Jessica, would you like to add Should I move on? Yeah, I hear a lot of uh, background noise, uh, but that, so for me, um, I agree with actually all the, the, um, the area already mentioned, but for me, I think the single cell uh, omics would really um, be, I think it would be kind of a ultimate measurement challenge in terms because right now obviously you've seen some proteomics or or uh, or even lipidomics, but I think some of the low abundance stuff for us we're really interested in neural peptides in those like uh, in the brain or individual cells or cancer. Uh, I think their uh, cancer diagnosis in in those area would be very very uh, co interesting and compelling and still remains a big challenge. And another area I think is the structural uh, aspect, you know, like either combined with other uh, structural technology, but also with mass spectrometry, if we could get more like, a, so we heard uh, Vicky Wysocki talking about some of these native mass spec, but I feel like right now the native mass spec is still not very sensitive. Um, and if you can really push the sensitivity and also really understand like the post translational modification, their impact on the structure and function, I think that's going to be huge. So I'll just say one other thing that I'll, I'll add is that um, in lipidomics, you know, one of the issues we have is uh, our uh, is typical is there's how to do pathway analysis. That's because we don't get enough structural information on the lipid species that we're measuring. And there are methods out there to do it. Um, but they're not commercially available, or at least they're, you have to modify commercially available systems. And so having more of those options available on mass specs, I think would be helpful to kind of get into the, the, the structural assignments of lipids, and help with more pathway analysis. Excellent. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next question. This one sort of, I, I, you know, recognizing that m much of our audience are graduate students and postdocs, and so I thought maybe it would be great if we could have you all give your thoughts on like what skill sets um, in the area of mass spectrometry are going to be, in your opinion, 
you know, most helpful to these students, um, you know, uh, as they move into the into the job field and to, you know, like, uh, well, this in your mind, um, are there certain things that they really should learn or um, like having any experience in mass spectrometry in any area? Is that is that going to be um, super helpful? Uh, just sort of career advice, I guess, if, if you want to go. Maybe we can start with uh, Jessica and, and move around my screen. Yeah. Sure. Um, the first thing that came to mind for me when you said that was that I feel like the most valuable skill set that that students can have is really is is the data part is like understanding the data. Um, you know, and this is I guess I'm thinking about this from the perspective of of you know experiments where you're using off the shelf math. You're not you know not the necessarily the folks that are building mass specs, that's a different career path. But if you want to be a an application, a mass spec applications person, then understanding what the data means, like what it what it's telling you, like and how to interpret it, and then how to process it. Because we're just going to keep generating more and more and more data. And at the end of the day, it always seems like that's the that's the bottleneck and that's the skill set that really pushes people over the edge in terms of productivity is the ability <laughs> yes. to manage all, all the data. <laughs> you can generate data in a week and you can spend a year looking at it. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yes. I'll add to that too that having good statistical background is really important. Um, you know, a lot of students, some students don't get really good statistical, um, you know, experience when they get to grad school. And when you're dealing with large data sets, that's really important, um, especially with now A and N and all these and our AI initiatives going on right now. I think it's really important to, to capitalize on that. Go ahead, Ling Jun. Yeah, yeah, I, I second those. I think definitely, you know, mass spec is like kind of a, a and now we're entering the data science era, so that area for sure. I think people, uh, even students in my lab who um, has like st taking statistical classes or some of them uh, really into coding or taking some programming classes or that will help them in like writing some calls or trying to do data processing more effectively. Um, but like what Jessica was saying that it really depends also on what type of uh, position because I think uh, people in the mass spec field is, is really for graduate students is a great area, great profession to be in there. Um, the job market is really great, so it depends on what you like to do. If you want to be an application scientist or in a working in a pharma or biotech company or in a mass spec vendor, so if you on the more on the mass spec side, certainly you want to. I still think for all of us as a mass spec group, the students obviously need to have the hardcore um, knowledge and skill set for uh, both operating the mass spec instrument and understand the inner workings and or um, also sample preparation. I think it's critically important, especially collaborating uh, with biologists because uh, regardless of what, how fancy your instrument, if your sample prepared not well, like they call it garbage in, garbage out, then you're, you're wasting a lot of uh, precious instrument time. So I think that sometimes uh, students don't necessarily recognize that it's so important to understand, uh, to learn about sample pre uh, preparation. I think both Jess Jessica and, and John gave great lectures today to highlight how important uh, that you, you know, you need to pay attention to the front end sample preparation for both metabolome, lipidome, that's how you get those great data. So that's another aspect that people may not, or at least mass spec uh, students may not pay as much attention as uh, needed. Uh, I'll add to that too that chromatography is another thing that is useful to learn as well and it's very valuable to have that experience. Um, I, 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 my, my suggestion would be to be as well rounded as you can from sample to you know manuscript and so you you learn is you know you become independent in all those categories I think then you'll be marketable in pretty much any job at that point so. Excellent. Uh, great, great advice. So, hey, I realize now as we've been moved on to our third question that I prepared 
Um, we had a couple of ideas from the students on on the first questions, which were technology needs. So I thought I would share them with everybody. So uh, we because I think they're great ideas. So uh, Ankush Chakraborty, I, I hope I pronounced that close to correct, um, says in terms of needs, um, how about you know being able to track dr drug receptor binding in real time, uh, these sorts of things and figuring out. So I, I think that's a great technological gap uh, that is pointed out. So just wanted to share that with everybody. And then um, another need here by Anonymous uh, is, um, you know, uh, we, we really should be able to figure out how to get a measure of mistranslation of proteins in a cell. And, you know, right now, most of that stuff is probably not something we may collect data on, but we don't actually, we toss it. So I think that's a great point that there are likely um, things that appear in our data that we don't know what they are and our mainstream processing tools don't allow us to. We toss them with the trash and um, probably the gold is going out sometimes, right? And um, Jessica, you talked about this in terms of just identifying metabolites, right? This is a huge challenge, but all sorts of these weird things. So I wanted to share those. And then I thought there, there was another um, uh, technical question that I wanted to tee up for the group here. Maybe we'll start with Ling Jun on this one because I, I think this one is um is right up your alley. What what's your thought? What are our thoughts on current technology of of mass spectrometry imaging? Oh, that's a great one. Yeah. So I think certainly mass spec imaging is a, a very active research area and has a lot of potential, both in terms of. Um, you know, in biomarker discovery, uh, pathology, to combine with, you know, um, some of the uh, patho like a multi-model imaging to really improve the chemical information that we can obtain from these, you know, anatomical defined tissue sample, uh, like tissue section and those kind of things. But I think in terms of challenging challenges in area for development, I think still this sensitivity uh, that needs to be further improved. Uh, you've seen more applications for lipid. Lipid imaging is uh, kind of a very vibrant area in part because uh, lipid is also ionized super well, uh, many of the lipids in MALDI. So that's a great um, kind of a target analyze. But like, for example, looking at larger proteins, um, bigger size molecules, and also getting the chemical information is still hard because uh, primarily MALDI is singly charged ions, so your MSMS fragmentation efficiency is inherently low, um, and let alone if you uh, also don't have the separation that uh, that can go with like your regular uh, electrospray uh, ionization workflow. So that's why I think the, uh, for example, um, the ion mobility instrument platform like what uh, Brookers uh, just released, uh, well not just released, but has uh, on the market, these um, trapped eye mobility, Tim's top flex has uh, actually uh, get a lot of traction um, because this front end separation, gas based separation, is going to help uh, tremendously in terms of separating different uh, analyte classes and also for lipid structural isomers, like John was talking about. So I think those areas are going to see a lot of uh, development and improvement. I think uh, also quantitation is another aspect that uh, require a lot of development and, and that's all the area and, and certainly in drug development drug discovery area this is also getting more if you look at some of the bigger farmers like GSK Merck and, and several others are all uh, initiating or get building their uh, multi mass spec imaging platform so I think there's this is a, a great area to be in because there's still a lot of remaining challenges to to be solved. Thank you. Uh, anybody else want to go there? I, okay, mm -hmm. I'll uh, I'll keep moving. How about um, this one? Uh, and keep the questions coming in, students. I think they're great. Uh, you know, I think one of the things that um, is, if we think about multiomics, we have labs and mass spectrometers set up to do metabolomics or lipidomics or proteomics. Um, but it's always a same sort of underlying technology. Do, do, do it, what are you all thoughts on like, will that evolve over the next decade? And do, do you think that 
that we'll be able to do all of these molecules in a more unified, streamlined way. Uh, whoever wants to go after that first, go ahead. Should we want that? <laughs> it's a, it's, yeah. That's a that's a tough one. We we have we we tried doing multiomics, you know, doing you know like a blood dye extraction and trying to do different omics from the extract. And that obviously it's a crude extraction, but um, when we compared it to doing the sample individually, um, it never was as good. Now, so the question is, is the compromise enough for what you're getting out of it? Um, and that'll be dependent on the sample and, and, and the question, I guess. Uh, so it depends on how much information you want. Everybody wants more and more and more data. I think once you start compromising, you're gonna be getting you know, a little bit of each, but maybe not, you know, some of the trace level stuff, I think that is gonna be lost, which oftentimes is more interesting. Um, but that's a good question. I mean, you know, with some of the miniaturization stuff that's that's starting to happen, maybe there's a, a path for that there. Um, so you're not dealing with a lot of excess background stuff, but I think it's always gonna be an issue of sensitivity um, and what you can measure. Um, Interesting question, though. Jessica, do you have a thought? Go ahead. Yeah. Ooh, now I'm getting some feedback. But thanks, Josh. Uh, I'll comment. I I agree with John that you know we've tried, we've done it sometimes too, and that's you know you can you can do it, um, but you you definitely lose stuff. And I think that um, so I I worked a large part of my career in a core facility setting where we had. A wide variety of instruments and we also had a wide variety of, of people with different skill sets um, that really is what enabled us to do some of those sort of multi-dimensional analyses where we were looking at different parts of the samples but i think that that's that's the limitation like one part of it is the is the instruments and yes like you can in theory use an orbit trap to do all the things but that's only a really small part of the experiment right and you have to have people who know how to treat the samples and that's not always the same for different types of molecules how to prep them and then how to analyze the data and all of these things that go into doing a good experiment are at least right now very different whether you're looking at proteins or metab you know metabolites or lipids specifically or and so i feel like that might be the bigger challenge more than the mass spec piece yeah, so when we did our multi-omics stuff, we would spike in internal standards for both metabolomics and lipidomics. And the problem is, you know, there's a lot of uh, cross transfer, right? You get, you know, some internal standards show up in both, um, you know, phases. And so, and you did probably the same thing for the molecules themselves. So that that's always going to be a concern. But I, I do like the idea of it. But I, yeah, it's it's hard. <laughs> Definitely hard. <laughs> it's, 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 it's sometimes, sorry, I was just, sometimes when we had your sample limited, I think it, it's a worthwhile. Like if you only have a very small amount of sample and you're trying to get as much out of it, I think that that would maybe force my hand to explore stuff. But if I have enough sample, I probably by default always do it individually. Yeah, and I also want to add just a little caveat there. Like, I mean, I even though we're all mass spectrometrists and we're all doing kind of the same thing, you know everybody's got their own set of expertise. And so while yes, we could do, you know, protein phosphorylation in our lab on our instruments, we're not experts in this, so we're not gonna do it as well as maybe another lab who focuses just on that and that's what they do. And so I feel like there, that's also a main limitation. Like it's really hard to be an expert at all of the applications <laughs> and do them well um, and get good data. So if you try to do a lot of different things, you're just gonna end up with sort of a lot of surface level data, which might be fine depending on the application. So. All right, I think we've explored that one pretty well. Uh, I've got a I've got a couple others coming in here from the students. So uh, here's one. Um, Ling Jun, you maybe uh, this one fits really in with what you presented and uh, I'll tee it up for you. Multiplexing or label free for shotgun proteomics. Where do we go? What do you think? Yeah, that's a that's a good one. I mean, it's obviously very fitting to what we talked about yesterday. I think it really <clears throat> depends on your goal and also the samples at hand. If you have many 
condition, let's say like a clinical specimen is like 100 plasma samples and all those you need to compare rapidly uh, for protein uh, abundance and those kind of things. I think the, you know, the multiplexing would be a good way uh, to, to go, go after. And label free, as I mentioned, one, yeah, it doesn't require and, and does not have a limitation of number of samples. But if let's say that you're using facility instrument or if you have limited uh, instrument time, and I think that sometimes is not very practical because the, the label free for in general for each sample you need to have like three replicates to get enough statistical and, and if you have a large number of samples and also your uh, LC uh, retention time may not be always very reproducible. So those are the issues that you need to consider and talk and, and think about. And also for sample preparation, I think for multiplexing, one uh, thing is that because you're doing labeling and then you have to uh, sample cleanup, sometimes you, you may get uh, sample loss in those kind of situations. And for label free, as we mentioned, that you can do like a wide dynamic range. And some of, uh, in in our cases, when we work with really low abundance stuff, sometimes actually it helps because you don't add the additional step to do purification. You don't have that sample loss um, that oftentimes accompany with this large scale kind of a processing. So so it really, I would say, it also depends on the situation and the goal of your experiment and the type of samples you have at hand. Thank you, that, that was great. So um, Jessica, I wanted to ask you a question about in your talk, one of the things that you teed up as like one of the central problems for metabolomics is this um, ID problem, right? And like, how do we solve that? And this is, you know, I, I completely agree. And, you know, it's it's been there for a while. Do you think in 10 years it'll be completely resolved and it'll be like doing proteomics where you just, you know, have this great database or like what, what's your prediction? How's it going to play out? Fast forward. That's a good question. I would say, I don't know if it's my prediction. My hope is that as a, as a field, like I, I think, and I, um, blanking on her name, but the person that was moderating when I was when I was uh, during my session, she brought this up. She, you know, is that um, there's a little bit of a there's a lot of great work that's going going on right now in the context of creating databases and tools. Um, but I think what's different about metabolomics than how the proteomics field sort of evolved is there's a little bit of there's less um, coordination and cooperation among those efforts. And there's been you know, there are not to say that there's none, um, but there's a, not a whole lot of things that work that well together. And so we have multiple databases out there that are sort of growing independently. Um, and so my hope is that, and I think what we need in order to get there in 10 years is for those things to, to come together um, and to be able to take advantage of all the data that's out there um, and figure out how to mine it and, and put it all together to make for the community to make use of it. So you're not you're you're hoping. Uh, you're, hoping. <laughs> I, I think that's I do too because I, I think, actually I think it's very possible that we could be we could be leaps and bounds further even now. I think. Do, um, do you think these um, fancy uh, uh, artificial intelligence learning, deep learning things are, 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 are you know people have been able to do some pretty remarkable things with peptide mass spectral prediction. I haven't really followed the metabolite area in that space. What 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 do you do? Do you think that's going to be a path for? Well, us? and to be honest, I I haven't that much either, and I'm going to blame you know a lot of that on this last year of being way out of touch with everything. Um, but I but I do. I think that you know like computationally, there's so much we can do now, and and in kind of going back, there's, there's so much data out there, and so even just like anecdotally within our own lab, when we, you know, take the time to, to query like data that we run now versus data that we ran a year ago for, for another project, like you start to see things showing up a lot and again and again and like, and there, you know, so like there's so much data out there and if we could figure out, and there are people that are trying to mine that data 
And so if we can figure out how to do that really effectively, then I think that could push us so much further into the future. Um, and in a way that's accessible to, to all the people that are doing these types of work and that works with the different vendor software data formats and blah, 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 blah. Um, so I think it's a matter of the computational tools and then also mining all this data that we're generating. Because again, I think somebody said this earlier, we're like, we can generate a ton of data. That's not the problem. <laughs> so is, was the question identifying new metabolites or making sure the identifications we're making are correct? Both, I think. I was thinking both, like, you know. Both. Uh, and then let me uh, let me adapt it a little bit for you, John, because uh, in your in lipid in the lipid area, um, you know we 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 dabble a bit there, and I know that we have these databases like in our own lab that we've tried to build. But as soon as somebody comes over and says, "Well, here's this you know organism, can you do lipids?" Like it's all different, and they don't work as well, and we don't like. How how are we like how what is your view on that question in the context of lipids? Yeah, I mean I think a lot of what Jessica was saying obviously is really relevant to the lipid world. I think one of the things that would be useful is for people to start uh, putting their data online. Um, you know, that's there's some journals that are starting to to demand that you have your journal your your data uploaded, and I think that's good for obviously transparency, but it's also good because you know. Some people work on alligators and and all, you know like fish and all kinds of other organisms and um, you know having those data sets available to compare is 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 as much as you can and I think would be really helpful. Um, I think the other thing that's really important is you know uh, making sure we have you know the you know people educated on what lipids should be expecting you know from a biological standpoint um, in your organism. Or whatever you're studying, um, there was a couple of labs that participated in an interlab study a long time ago, and, and a lot of the lipids they were reporting, I, I'd never even seen before. Um, you know, they, they were just really weird. And I talked to them later, and they basically just reported whatever their software spit out. And so I think, you know, you know, we all probably are guilty to this to a certain extent, but you know, actually going through and manually inspecting and curating your data is really important. Um, because, you know, it's like anything, we're making a lot of interpretations and, and conclusions based on the data we're, we're, we're putting out there. And so I think you know, training students how to go through and manually curate their data, you know, look at whether or not it makes sense from a biological standpoint. I think there's there's a lot of things we get to the end and we kind of, I'm not saying, you know, we, we kind of maybe don't do a lot of the things that we need to do to, to finish the loop. <laughs> To make sure that it's that the data is real and so um yeah i mean it's really easy to collect lipid data that's not the hard part the hard part is you know presenting the stuff that actually makes sense and uh, it's something in my lab I, we talk about all the time so we we do a lot of environmental stuff so we work with aquatic species we work with birds we work with you know all kinds of animals and and matrices and you know, the they it's remarkable how easy the data is generated, but how hard it is to actually like make sense of it sometimes. And especially when the organisms we're looking at, there, there's lipids that we don't know. I mean, we I think we probably about 10% of the features that we see in a lipidomics run we can actually identify. And um, you know, that's that means there's like you know 90% other stuff there that we don't know what it is. And so I think we got a long ways to go on a lot of those different aspects. That's, that's really funny. Uh, Josh, you're yeah, on mute. There I am. Sorry, I, I hit it twice. <laughs> that's a great summary on both of those. Uh, it reminds me. So I was just I was thinking about the opening lecture we had for this um, conference was by um, Scott McClucky, and he was talking about um, the first mass spectrometer by, you know, in the lab of JJ Thompson at, at Cambridge. And that, and this is sort of building on this Nobel Prize discussion we earlier had about mass spec Nobel Prizes. And his student later on went and made the resolution of that mass spectrometer better. And this was taught to, the, to, to our whole class in the context of we went from res resolution of 10 and, and uh, Aston got it up to about 1,000. And when that happened, the spectrograph showed lines, two lines for neon, and he didn't really go into that level of evil. I've, I'm familiar with the story. And therefore, 
Aston could say uh, there's isotopes, there's the existence of isotopes. And I think it's the, you know, one could argue that uh, he didn't improve the resolution because he knew isotopes existed and he wanted to, I don't know the story here, I'm just surmising. <laughs> uh, but he probably made the mass spectrometer better and discovered the isotopes. I'm gonna go find out after this. But the point is, uh, uh, that technical improvement led to the observation. and. How many observations that are of that level of importance? Well, I don't know. We're not going to discover an isotope, but but we could be discovering and overlooking lipids that are super important, but they're different than what we've seen, and so we don't know. We could be doing the same with metabolites, and we certainly could be doing the same thing with proteins in our data that don't match to what's predicted. That's the interesting stuff. I think that's where the opportunities are. So uh, it's a great conversation. Um, I've got another question that came in that I wanted. Uh, I was hoping Ling Jun might comment on, and the question is: Do you see proteomics moving towards top-down and sample processing, giving given advantages in structure and PTM? So, what 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 are your thoughts on that? Uh, well, that's a that's a great one. I think certainly we we'll, we are seeing uh, more. Uh, prevalent, well, I would say, like, uh, I would say to some extent, top down is moving towards more mainstream, but I think it, given the current um, instrumentation, capability, sensitivity, and, and all of these things, and the information that we can get from these biological samples, I would argue that uh, right now the bottom up still is the mainstream technology. Um, in large part, is also because of the, the sensitivity for the the top down, I, I just don't think it's quite there yet. Um, obviously, there, there are a lot of improvements. Um, and, and I think um, I would say even for the bottom up proteome, uh, approach that we still learn a lot, a great deal of information from, you know, the, we've seen great work from many groups, including people on this call, uh, the PTM that we can also learn about, um, you know, the function. Uh, my, sense is that if you don't see something then you know like the sensitivity would limit your coverage then you're not going to learn um you know what what it means for structurally and those kind of things although we obviously i think the the sensitivity in my opinion the sensitivity is still uh, not quite there yet um in the throughput and everything but there are a number of uh, both sample preparation strategies and also separation and uh informatic tools that are uh, helping people to get more information out of the, um, you know, the top down um, scheme. So I would say they're still complementary. I, um, I, I think the bottom up still have a, a lot more to offer uh, in, in this, the whole proteomics landscape. That, that would be kind of my, my answer, but certainly we like to get more structural information in, in those, uh, you know, PTM and, and stuff like that. Thank you, thank you. So now maybe we can uh, think about, I had a note here from a student that uh, says, you know, well, most, most mass spectro, at least academic mass spectrometry work is funded by the National Institutes of Health. So, and, 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 and the question is, you know, what have been, what can we as a community point to as successes that have contributed to human health in our broad field? Uh, it's not a question I think about all the every day, and I don't have examples that I can pull out, but maybe some of you do, or we can at least talk about it. I thought it was an interesting question. Who wants to go first? I, I would, I'd say that I guess the first thing that comes to my mind is, you know, I know that uh, there's some work, and I don't remember who is doing it, but I know um, Kimi Cruz is involved in, in trying to use ceramides in the clinic um, to, um, uh, I think I think it was cardiovascular disease. Um, they're actually using in cl clinical trials or they're, they're starting to assess whether or not there's potential. So I think the idea of trying to take, um, you know, specific lipid targets and actually implementing into a clinical setting, I think is, you know, obviously promising. There's still a lot to, to work to do and a lot of stuff to, to figure out, but I think that, you know, the, if think of the next stage of lipidomics and, you know, branching from the research side into, you know, actual clinical applications, I think, um, you know, the, the idea that that's potentially starting, I think is, is promising. 
Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Anybody else want to uh, throw in their two cents? I, I can throw in mine too, but go ahead, Jessica. Oh, I was just going to say, I'm, I'm thinking hard, but one thing that popped into my head was, you know, the use, pretty widespread adoption now of technologies like Mat uh, MALDI MS in, in the detection of pathogens um, for clinical diagnostics. So that's something that um, has made a difference and uses MassLEC. <laughs> Also, if you've if you've ever um, had a baby or or been around, yes, uh, you know that they they prick the heel of the baby right right as soon as they're born. They take some blood samples, and some of those samples I don't know if all, but some of those get run very quickly within a couple of days on a mass spectrometer, a triple quad mass spectrometer, where they look at the ratio of phenylalanine to tyrosine, and uh, there are errors that can be. Um, that can that can be genetic that can happen in in uh, metabolism so that you can't process one and the other. I can't remember which way it goes, but it, it becomes toxic. Uh, and uh, and so the if you can catch those babies early, you can feed them a diet without one of those amino acids, and they will uh, they will be fine. So, uh, but if you don't the, if you don't catch it, uh, they can uh, bad things can happen very quickly. So that's that's been going on for 20, 30 years. Um, that is one example, and, uh, and there's an, uh, a student just posted here, um, Trent, that uh, uh, Eber in the lab at UT Austin is doing mass spec pen in a hospital room, which which could be very cool, and I totally agree. But I would say also, even on a more basic side, um, you know, most of the mass spectrometers, at least in academics across the world, are being pointed at biological problems. Now, sometimes those problems are very basic, uh, but you know we even saw, you know, in in many of the in the research lecture today, for example, um, you know, phosphorylation cascades being worked out. It was in a cell model system. It's not in a clinic, but that's working out basic biochemistry. We saw that in just about every lecture that was given. Right? People are showing biological examples. So, you know, I think uh, one of the one of the things that we we can certainly claim success as a field that is that we have really supported basic biochemical research in, in many different ways. And then the clinic is, is a, you know, I think there's always room for more impact and I hope that happens. And we've talked about a few ways, but I, I, I would like to think that we've had a big impact as a community. Uh, Ling Jun, do you want to add anything to that before I move oh, on? Oh, absolutely. I think uh, people have, uh, get their points across. Um, really, I think in the diagnos disease diagnosis, is one of the probably the most prominent in direct relevant or more translational aspect. But definitely, I would say, you know, like if you look at uh, NI National Institute on Aging and all of these uh, different funding agencies that funded Project, many of these mass spec related projects geared dear toward to improving our fundamental understanding of the pathogenesis process or mechanism or generate like these molecular uh, diagnostic uh, tools or finding some of these molecules that could lead to early detection either of the disease uh, cancer or um, these um, neurological disorders so I, I think there all of these examples probably highlight the the importance and, and impact of these research. Absolutely. So um, I want to make a point now from uh, Matoshi Suzuki, who 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 wants to point out another technology that is in need. Uh, uh, and the point here is that biologists in the area of infectious diseases want uh, is a de novo sequencing of antibodies in mixtures uh, like plasma from patients so that they can understand um, uh, what antibodies are being effective, and uh, and I think that's a, a whole nother area where um, you know we heard about top down and, and other shotgun techniques. That, so so thank you. That's a great point. Um, you know I think what, what what I'd like to do now is uh, I have a question. It's a little bit less about technology, and we're we're sort of winding winding in here. And then if any of the panelists have ideas that I didn't get to that they want to talk about, please bring them up. But but uh, one of the, you know, I think we have a really diverse um, student group here, and um, one of the, the the questions that I often get is, um, 
you know, what is the best approach for someone who's primarily interested in studying biochemistry to integrate mass spectrometry into their research? So, you know, they're uh, a postdoc or graduate student and they're going to start their own lab. You know, do they invest in a mass spectrometer? Do they collaborate? And, and I guess it really depends on their own circumstances. But uh, how, how should someone who's a primarily a biochemist but really loves the power of mass spec, how should they integrate that into their research? Any advice? Uh, I'll, I guess I'll start. I, I'll do the opposite. So I, I was traditionally trained as an analytical chemist in mass spectrometry, and then I did a postdoc in a molecular biology lab. So I, they did it dabbled with mass spec, and so I, I put myself completely out of the element of where I was because I, I wanted to learn how to take what I knew about mass spec and do cool biological experiments. Uh, but I realized when I graduated, I was very deficient. I was, wasn't as smart as I thought I was with biology. So I wanted to get more background. And uh, so I think that putting yourself out of the element, doing a postdoc somewhere, learning the trade, um, it learns, you learn how to communicate. Um, I learned how to communicate with biologists and biochemists. Um, you learn a lot of different tools like cell culture and, and, you know, there's just a lot of things that I learned that I never would get if I stayed in a mass spec environment, um, depending on the environment, but you typically wouldn't get as much experience with that uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think putting yourself out there and, and doing a postdoc in a lab that does a lot of mass spec, I think would be the best way to get that experience that you would need. It worked out for, for me to do the opposite. So I think it, it should work for the other way around. Excellent advice. Anybody else want to comment? Thoughts? Sure. I would say, um, I, I mean, I think this really depends, but I've seen situations where, you know, someone who's primarily a biologist might want to get into mass spec and think it's really cool, like Josh said, and and then they end up getting an instrument that ultimately doesn't really get used or taken care of because there's a little bit of an underestimation of, of what that entails and what that involves. And so I don't know that it's always because it's and it's also a huge investment, right? Um, and an ongoing investment. Um, and so I, I don't know that it always makes sense for someone like that to decide, okay, I'm going to invest in a mass spec and have it in my lab. And also, because we all know, obviously, too, that the technology changes so fast. So you invest and then five years later, your instrument's a little bit old. Um, it might need to be replaced. And so I guess I would encourage and what I and what I enjoy is is, you know, working collaboratively and finding like your collaborative partner where you can really take advantage of everybody's skill set and expertise and together you know you can solve these problems that are are really hard to do individually and in my humble opinion i think that that's way more fun also anyways <laughs> yeah uh i like jessica's approach I, I agree that the science is really advanced to this kind of an interdisciplinary um environment and context and no one is going to be expert for everything so it really depends on, you know, uh, this individual's interest in the career uh, aspiration, the goal, right? If you want the best known or solving a particular um, biochemical problem or uh, these mechanistic uh, problem, or, you know, trying to be more known for, or, or actually wanting to develop the technology and methodology. I think there's this kind of, a um, uh, synergistic uh, aspect. I think a lot of times actually you find the biological problem can drive your the technology or the method development. We're really pushing the limit and you can work with either your collaborator or actually you have can come up with some uh, creative ways and we've seen a lot of great examples. Some of the really clever uh, chemical biology approaches that the, the, those folks are not mass spectrometers, but they are actually inventing some of the new technology like apex and all those kind of things that really also pushing the proteomics technology and mass spec driven uh, kind of uh, world so i think it it can go both ways and then certainly the mass spectrometries will also be uh, beneficial from working with these uh, biologists to have the right question the right problem uh, to really 
push the technology forward and make the greater impact than just running standards, right? So I, I would I would just add to that that I, I agree that that's excellent advice. And I would only add that it is worthwhile to at least get some education on mass spectrometry uh, because those collaborations only work as good as you understand how a mass spec works and what the potential is and, and being able to describe what you want or what you're looking for. Um, vice versa, it's always good for a mass spec, mass spectrometrist to know about the biology and biochemistry as well. So I think that will have a, a large role in terms of how successful collaborations are. Thank you all. Well, I, I have a few other questions on my list, but I think we're, we're getting close to the end here. And I want to give uh, you all panelists, uh, is there any is there anything that I that you think we we should say or talk about or ideas that that, that are appropriate here? Uh, I want you to, to, to go ahead and take the floor if we've missed something or you think there's something uh, that, that we could talk about briefly. But you don't have to. I'm just uh, floor is open. We've gotten to all of the Q and A from the students, so uh, yeah. I would, I'll just say that um, you know. I feel like I've been pretty fortunate in my career so far, and, and so I always like paying it forward. And so if any students have any questions about working in the government or you know, transitioning to becoming an assistant professor or doing postdocs, um, feel, feel free to reach out to me. I'll, I'll tell you what I think and, and my advice in terms of how to get jobs or, or you know, work in those areas. And so um, you know, don't, don't feel shy to do so. Well, I'd like to, I think I'll wrap wrap up here and then go to the closing, uh, but I would like to, before you all go, I would like to thank, I'd like to thank uh, John Bowden, Jessica Prenny, and Ling Jun Lee for uh, participating in this panel. It's been a lot of fun uh, just talking technology and uh, thinking if we were young, what would we do? Uh, this is great. Uh, <laughs> you all are young, I feel old. Um, and uh, I really appreciate you all taking the time to be here and, and uh, uh, I want to thank you for that.